you ready? Yeah? Yeah. Do you need to introduce me or not? I'm, I'm self-moderated. Okay. So my name is Marshall. Um, I'm uh, a lone builder in Fairbanks, Alaska, trying to build uh, high-efficient buildings in a climate where it's almost impossible to do so. Uh, for the last 10 years, uh, I was on this quest trying to find a perfect wall. Because I think walls are enormously crucial to, to our buildings. So, you know, 5,500 miles of wall, and I still don't have an answer. Let's see where, 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 where we are right now. Um, I work with the Coal Climate Housing Research Center in Fairbanks as a consultant. I run a construction company. And I just have a very curious mind, and I take nothing for granted. I want to see data or believe something. Uh, I don't care about movie other than modeling it, but I want to go back and see if this really is reality a year later. And uh, that's kind of what this is all about. So, who's familiar with uh, persistent or remote walls? Hands up. With what? Remote or persist walls. Out insulation. Okay, few. So, uh, the original idea uh, with persist walls was created in Canada long, long time ago, in 54. We need to place insulation in cold climates on the outside. Why would that be? Anybody go camping in here? Where do you put your insulation hat? Under you or on top of you? <laughs> it's like you got to insulate towards the cold. And this is really a cold climate. I'm talking about cold climate mainly. Uh, I, I, I work and live in a cold climate. So we're placing insulation on the outside. Uh, we have done extensive research at the research center on this wall, we have uh, seven, eight years of data. We have more data than what we know what to do with. So there's nothing uh, which we haven't researched and tested in various climates, from Juno, very wet, very similar to northwestern climates, to very cold climates. <coughs> this wall, you can't make fail. You can stand there with a water hose, you can do anything to it, this thing works. Uh, I built over the last 10 years buildings, any building system you could imagine. Uh, for me, this was the ultimate answer. And we built at least 50 homes with up to 12 inches of foam on the outside. Works really, really, really well. But this is not really what I want to talk about. If you're interested in that, here's the web page. We have a manual, very extensive manual. I've written an article at GLC three years ago uh, with some details on it. Uh, all the information is out there. There's one problem with this. It's embodied in it. It's 100% petrol based, and it takes a lot of energy to make a wall function in our climate. And that was really my main motivation in looking at something else. How, we, how can you get away from using a product which is just petrol based? So if we're looking at embodied energy, energy it takes to make a material in manufacturing and transportation. If we're looking at foam, we're just like cellulose, it's a factor 64. So it takes 64 times more energy to make this material. And now we're putting a lot of insulation on in cold climates. So is this a good answer? Maybe not. Uh, anybody building with ICFs, with insulated concrete forms? This even works. Look at this. Concrete and steel. That's terrible. There's so much embodied energy. In a cold climate, it doesn't really work. Because you have all the thermal mass insulated. It is not part of the building envelope. You have to put a lot of insulation on the outside to make it work. So uh, I came up with this grand idea three, four years ago to basically do a persist remote wall cellulose, so it's exactly the same principle, probably you can't see it all that well, but it's basically a structure <coughs> with insulation wrapped around it. I call it the arctic wall, we can call it anything, it really doesn't matter. There's two things about it. Number one, it's diffusion open. That means it has <coughs> drying potential in any direction. Why is that important? Interior, yeah, interior humidity is going to fluctuate, and you're going to you're going to have condensation potential. Right. Diffusion.
clean open means basically nothing. Like in, in, in our everyday life, we, we have it everywhere. In uh, a vortex jacket, who knows what a vortex jacket is? Everybody in this room does, right? Uh, it's basically you go out, run, and you take on your raincoat and you run. Are you comfortable? No, you're not. Put on your vortex. Are you comfortable? No. Somewhat. No. <laughs> but not really, right? <laughs> Somewhat. Somewhat. Right. The problem is here. Hi. We are arrogant. As human beings, we are always arrogant. We think we can build something perfect. We think we can build a wall which is perfect and it will never get wet. That's our assumption. That's not the case. You know, over time, moisture will be getting into this wall. The problem is what? How is it going to get out? It can't. On any normal building systems, you know, our typically cold climate wall, what is it? You know, we're looking at, uh, we're looking at uh, basically a 2 by 6 wall with plastic on the inside and a bit of very impermeable sheeting on the outside. And it has a very bad potential to dry. So time basically can split big rocks like that and it will do anything to a building because it can't dry out. So that's my goal about diffusion open walls. And this is an experiment, and it's an ongoing experiment. We don't have enough data to back this up, but we'll look at it. So instead of placing foam, we're creating a white cavity. We're dense packing it uh, at, by now, four points per square foot with uh, cellulose. Cellulose is basically a 85% recycled product for the consumer. Uh, we manufacture that basically 200 miles away from where I live. So it's very low uh, amount of energy and transportation. And uh, it's just a much, much more sustainable product. And then uh, we're looking at thermal conductivity in materials. We're looking at foam <coughs> or fiberglass or uh, cellulose. What are we looking for in a material, in a wall? What do we want? We want a low lambda value or a high. What, what do we want? Low. We want low conductivity <coughs> for various reasons, and this is pretty universal for heating or cooling climates, in my opinion. So, if we're looking at foam it's down here versus cellulose, there's a big difference. And, uh, will mass give us any advantage in cold climates or in warm climates in a wall? Can that be an advantage? We'll see. The problem is here, really. We have to start with the problem. And we have to realize that this is so important. We live in climates which are very extreme, but we create microclimates inside. So we have problems. And we're having a problem right there. We are defining nature by its own means. So the system we put in place to separate these two spaces, we better carefully address. And uh, you know, here we are. We are staying on a standard wall with two by six walls. We have solid surfaces. We have uh, insulation which we place in. We have 50 below on the outside, 70 degrees on the inside. And what makes this wall not fail? What keeps it? from not rotting out. Moist, uh, the heat transfer. What, what, what's our safety net in this wall? Code prescribed. Building code puts a safety net in cold climates into this wall so it can't fail. What is it? It's six mil holy, right? It's a plastic bath which we're placing where? Where do we put the safety net? Inside. We put it on the warm side, we have our finish, sheet drop, and then we have our safety net right behind it. And there's the problem. Any puncture through here will puncture our safety net. And this is what we get. I don't know how many people in this room really look at buildings later. I've looked at a lot of buildings and I've found a lot of stuff. Two years later, you have problems like this in a 
very well built house in an extreme climate. It's just because it can't function. This wall defines physics and all the laws of nature in our climate. It can't function, and it doesn't. And this is what we get. And uh, this is uh, <coughs> from a test trailer which we had up for the last two years. Uh, these two walls, the, the whole purpose of the test was basically uh, for retrofit applications. Now we're looking at basically a two-year-old wall. Look at how much mold we already created. So since it's retrofit, we didn't place a big bear on the inside on this. Four inches of EPS on the outside, so it's a considered a remote wall, but it's only four inches for our climate. We really need six. Dew point, moving it out. Now look at all of this mold right here. Where do you think that's coming from? We hung a picture. This is one nail hole where a picture was simulated. One little puncture into our safety net. The problem is we never look back into these walls. We build buildings, we live. Do we look ever back in? Mostly not. People get sick, they have problems, but you know, we all get sick. We all have problems. Where's it coming from? So this is really what we need to remember. We need to build good walls because otherwise they kill us slowly. <laughs> this is a serious problem. And it is that serious we have so many problems nationwide with mold. And mold can kill us. Now let's look at air. 30 quarts of water through one little hole in one heating system. That's a lot of water. If you're looking at diffusion, it's a third of a quart. What's the factor on that? It's huge. Here we are still arguing about air tightness. In passive house, how many people have engaged in these arguments? Oh, what are you saying? 0.6. Makes no sense. It's too tight. It makes sense. The physics are right here. And it's so important to understand the safety net here is stupid because people will damage it. 800 pound gorilla is called the homeowner. No matter how good of a building you build, you put that guy in there, he's going to do it safe. And you go back a year later, you do a blower to a test, you will be amazed at how many holes they've managed to put into your safety net. So we really, really, we got to do what? We got to build something idiot proof. And we have to understand durability. But temperature, relative humidity, and time. And time is really what's working against us oftentimes. So quickly, 35% roughly is heat loss through the envelope. It's the most surface area of the building. So we really should take care <coughs> of addressing it properly in a good building. This is my uh, personal laboratory. <coughs> It's uh, my personal house I built uh, last year. I finished it in January. Uh, we have sensors throughout the whole building. It does many things, but what we're talking about right now is the wall. Basically, this is uh, a diffusion open wall, no vapor barrier in Fairbanks, Alaska, at 14,000 PTV days. So, how can this building function? <coughs> Here's a shot basically of the wall. This here is our pressure boundary. This is our safety net. I'm using CDX plywood. Why CDX plywood? Uh, higher diffusion gradient? Diffusion. I, I'm sorry, higher perm? Perm. Uh, it's actually less perm on the CDX versus OSB plywood. Okay. Tougher. Lower density. Yeah, absolutely. That's a very, very important point. Oh, OSB is nothing else than glue, really, with some wood chips in it. <laughs> it's a bad material. Well, Why do we want wood versus plastic? Shouldn't be more resistant to mold. Right. I mean, it has to be. Plastic is a class one vapor barrier, so there's not enough permeability for diffusion. It keeps it out. So here we're saying basically we need to be able to transfer moisture in any direction. 
If we would put plastic here, what's the drying potential? Zero. Zero. Well, I know it's late. But you <laughs> Zero. 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 Well, not quite. We have a drying potential to the outside from here on. So, like a remote wall, if all of this here would be full, the drying potential would be only to the inside. A remote or a persist wall can only dry to the inside. This wall, since there is no real plastic material anywhere, it can dry in both directions. On the outside, we have a high permeable membrane. Could be tile, could be um, Sega high code, could be anything. A uh, fiberboard would be ideal. And on the inside, we have CDX plywood. CDX plywood has a uh, dry state, uh, a perm rating of about 0.4 0.6. Once it gets more uh, a higher moisture content, it goes up to 1.5. But the principle is this: we allow diffusion in both directions for drying potential. Uh, this wall, basically, uh, we've uh, developed on on the house originally. Some people uh, have maybe seen the slides last year. It was built very differently on this house as far as building it. Uh, I've built six more by now, and uh, we refined how to build it a lot. So it's all built on the ground, and it goes a lot faster. And there will be a report about all of this, about how to construct it. But uh, in short, basically, you know, we're creating a huge cavity in my climate, depending on where you are, of course, it would vary. I have a 24-inch thick wall in Fairbanks. We're creating an airspace on the outside. Why do we need an airspace on the outside? I live in the desert. I don't have rain problems. Why do we have an airspace? Assisted diffusion. Yeah. And why are? Since you're vapor permeable on both sides, you still want that air to circulate. Yeah. 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 I mean, we got that somehow. We're saying we want to dry out to the outside, yeah. ideally, right? Yeah. But where's that water going to go if the siding sits right on top of it? If we are trying to dry out a wall, which is a very, very good reason, we need an airspace. We take 10 sheets of OSB plywood, we put them outside in the yard. What will happen? We'll get wet. We'll get wet. Now we take 10 sheets of plywood, we put them out in the yard, but we put them on sticker. Off the ground, individual stickers in between. What will happen? Raise and lower with the relative. We'll still get wet, but it will have drying potential, right? Yeah. Yeah. It will get wet, but it will dry. So this is, this is like a really one-on-one -on -one basic. It makes sense to have an airspace between your building and the siding. And that's very, very basic physics. Only makes sense. We're blowing out basically uh, the cavity. Uh, it's pretty tricky. There's no question about it. It needs to be done carefully, otherwise we have settling. Uh, if we have settling, we have what? We have voids, we have no insulation. So this is uh, not as easy to build, really, in reality, than a classic remote wall because we have the potential of installation problems which will really, really be severe if it settles down. If we blow this at three pounds, three and a half pounds per square, it cannot settle That's <coughs> physics. But if we have any voids or we blow it at a lower density, like when we're blowing an attic, it's 1.4 pounds per square, just out of the hose, that will settle a lot. If you blow out an attic, you have easily three, four inches of settling. So it's, it's definitely technically uh, a little bit more advanced. We do this all in-house now for that reason, because I haven't found somebody else to rely on. On the outside, you know, the 1x4s go all the way up. We have a rain screen and we have insect uh, protection for uh, keeping the little guys out of the wall. And then the siding goes just on the outside. On this building, we tried out uh, product in Europe, the SEGA is made for uh, roofing applications. It's uh, basically approved for driven rain, and so it's a lot more durable than a regular tide it. More expensive. So is your exterior sheeting? CDS there is no sheeting. The outside is vapor, vapor open. So there is no sheeting on the outside. It's just basically a membrane stretched across the 2x4 frame, and that's dense pack. If we would put uh, another layer of sheeting on, we do two things. Number one, we increase costs. We double our costs. We've got to be cost efficient, so that's not really a good idea. And number two, 
what do we want? We want a factor 1 to 10 as far as permeability from the inside to the outside to promote best drying potential. So the SD110 basically means we have a material on the inside which is a 0.5, but realistically we really need to look at 1 because it's never dry. Uh, so what we need is at least 10 to 12 on the outside. Uh, the, the higher my climate at least, the higher the better to uh, allow drying potential for the outside. So this is uh, 34, Tyvek is at 54, as far as permeability goes. You mentioned so five. Five. Yep. Yep. And what are you, what are you blowing in through? In a previous photo, are you blowing through the edge? No, no, it's all blown in. Against that material. Yep. This bulges out, and you can kind of, this feels like a dense mattress, basically, is what you're after. But yeah, there's nothing else out there than this membrane. And then, are How you compartmentalizing vertically? On this, no. So we start at the bottom, work our way up. No fabric in between your stones. No. So is it one? No, no uh, you know, you, a fabric on a wall like this, I've seen this over and over, but in reality, it doesn't work. I just mean in like you're from stud every 24 inches yeah, on stud. I know what you mean. Oh, but that, that's really not the physics on, because this cavity is so wide. This is 18 inch cavity. Yeah. You know you you it's not a two by six wall which you just blow out on the netting. So there's no lateral um, line cavity. No, it's one continuous piece of insulation all the way around. And how do you get the proper density then? <laughs> It's challenging, it takes time. Uh, I work with uh, four manufacturers by now. I'm trying to come up with you know best practices on doing this and we're getting there for sure. Uh, th there will be a whole report about this, so uh, let's continue on, on how to build this. It's not really important right now. It's what we want to look at is, does this thing actually work or not? Uh, the other questions really to me are right now not, not, not essential. What about your condensation point in the situation? within the cellulose. Cellulose is very hygroscopic. Uh, that's what I want for my climate. If, if you put this thing into uh, Oregon, Portland, Juneau, it's a different story. You know, we're looking at dry cold climates right now. And uh, we can take one thing which works here and put it there and assume it works also. It doesn't. We have to be diligent and we have to test it. I mean, we will test this in Juno, which would be equivalent to a lot of the weather regions. So then you'll have an issue with comfort inside maintaining humidity, right? Given your situation. Not in my time. You have that? Don't you get that issue with trying to maintain a humidity in that type of climate? I would think. No. The CDX on the interior cord. We'll, we'll see it on the data here in a second. So there again, a couple of shots on the, on, uh, the windows are inset. They have to be inset in our apartment. It's very important, over insulated. Uh, here you can kind of see you know, a little bit of a bulge. And, uh, it's kind of a challenge sometimes to get it back to where it needs to be. Uh, this is kind of a sense on how thick this wall is. It's in my climate. So this is, uh, the window is halfway in the wall, it's not all the way to the inside. <laughs> uh, we do the same thing on the, on the lid. So the structural sheeting, our pressure boundary, 2 by 4 frame, comes up and it wraps all the way across the lid. Basically it's a cold roof, it's a trust based roof, but uh, we need to completely isolate that space. So we're creating a, a utility chase basically on the inside with the 2 by 4 framing. Uh, where wiring, ducting, and everything else can run. And uh, we will also need that uh, basically sealing with the 2 by 4s to support the weight of the cellulose. Our 100 cellulose is very heavy. A bag of cellulose is 25 pounds. So you're talking so much weight you could never support it with sheet rock alone. And uh, it creates you know, a perfect seal. It's basically, think about a cube out of plywood, which is taped to air seal. Meticulously, uh, you do that before you even put the roof on. You can uh, can uh, blow it or that house before I even have rolled my trusses. I can 
air pressure and test for leakage. It's very, very simple to uh, air seal a house like this. And it's very safe. Nobody can get to it. Our safety net is placed somewhere where it's protected by insulation and by a space where the homeowner can't just tap a nail into it. Of course, they can take a drill and drill through the wall, but they need a long drill bit. <laughs> and then we utilize this also on the top to run our ducting, basically where we need to have it really for best uh, efficiency on the uh, ventilation distribution. And uh, there's everything on the inside is conditioned space. You know, the pressure boundary is really on the outside of the plywood. So we have a lot more options of running electric. This is uh, 36 inches of cellulose, R115, so lots. But really what we want to come down to is this. Uh, what really happens in this wall? What's the first step we always need to do? We need to model it, right? We can't just build something and figure out, oh, is this going to work or not? We're using proper tools, Wolfie, uh, for modeling performance of walls in different climates. And again, you know, this is data for Fairbanks, Alaska. That means nothing for your climate, really. It is just an idea to spark maybe this is a solution for you. Is it the right solution? I have no idea. Because I don't live in your climate, I live in my climate. And that's something we can't get around. We need to look at all the different climate zones. And what's the big problem with a thick wall like this? You know, if that doesn't dry out or if there is a problem, we will have mold, we will have problems. So we need essential tools to start off with. But <coughs> curious, you know, over the last 10 years, I've done Wolfie and I look back at reality and it didn't match. <coughs> so there is no shortcut. We need essential tools, we need data collection, and we got thousands of sensors, which is expensive. This building, the monitoring on this building is $58,000. You know, that's, that's not cheap. And without funding, how do you do this? Without research. But without research, without trying to find real answers, how do we get there? There is no shortcut. So we're missing one thing. Mark, what is it? Data. Hmm? Data. Data. No, one more thing. <laughs> Experience. One more thing. The thing which really sucks. We need lots of patience. <laughs> because there's nothing past about building science. There really isn't. It's expensive and it takes time. You know, I'm showing you data for not even a year. So is that meaningful? Not really. It takes realistically 10 years. Do we have 10 years right now? We don't. So you know, we got to try and we got to move forward, but it's a problem. There's nothing which works past the building science. Uh, it takes time. And then now we need data. Here we go. Uh, everything else is garbage, but this is important. <laughs> We're looking at moisture content within the wall on a sensor basically placed on the framing, on the wood. We're staying well below 14, so we're absolutely safe. Well, we can, I was, we can talk to the wall. It's a fat wall. Person. Inside, outside. Wood. Wood. The wood. The framing. Outside, just think of insulation. So you're in the stud wall, the bearing wall. Yep. The structure. So the inner, the inner cord. Inner cord. Okay. It's just a structure. Okay. Everything else is just poo poo. Object. And it's and it's sensing the framing moisture content, the framing lumber. Yeah. Yep. We have more sensors we look at later, but this is to me right now the most crucial one. Did you start getting data right now? Yeah. 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 So you know, Wolfie showed us no problems in our climate. Data shows us no problem in our climate. That's the essential part. What's your here? Uh, we'll look at it. We'll look at it. But you know, the relative humidity in the air that changes frequently. This is really what will go up if you have a problem. And once we reach, you know, everything over 16 percent, I'm like, oh, I gotta watch this. Uh, once we hit 20, 25 percent, then we have issues, and we we having not a good drying potential. Anymore. This is really why I'm saying it's, it's really crucial. 
Now here we're looking at uh, different things. And, you know, these things are really hard. You've got to sit down for an hour just to understand one of them. So bear with me here. We got downstairs in basically, and we got dew points. Why, why do we see all of the scattered? Holiday. Why do we see all the scattered? And dew points. Because people live in buildings, right? They do their thing. Which is not a problem if the building can function with it. It's a problem if the building can't handle it. You know, it's no problem that we see all of this. As long as this is right where we need to have it. And that's to me kind of think of to, to grasp and to realize. You know, if we're looking at buildings, just at buildings, it's one thing. But if we need to look at people. Buildings are not about buildings. They are about people, about us living in here. And we want what? Healthy and very comfortable environment. Health, comfort, right? That's all we ask for. But that's very hard to achieve sometimes. <clears throat> so we are in a house, what do we do? We cook, we breathe, we bring friends in. What happens in the house? Relative humidity, what happens? Mm -hmm. Goes up. Is that a problem? <coughs> structure, the old block cabin, it can handle about 500 gallons worth of water, absorb it, release it, like a big sponge, in up, in up. Does that function? We have mold growth. The material itself functions. If we're looking at a, a high performing new building that we're preparing right here, it's five gallons of water. That's it. Wow. That's all the moisture this building can handle. Is where, where would it go? There's no way it can go anywhere. It can condense right here, but that's it. So humidity, I think, is not really the problem. The problem is can the build, building handle it or not? So uh, this is the bathroom. Bathrooms, higher humidity levels. We see more problems. You know, we see a little bit of different scatter. And then uh, you almost need to ignore this part because the building was finished. January. So what we're seeing there a lot is still building dry now. And it takes a year for building to dry out. So there's a lot of scattered here, which is kind of meaningless. We are basically seeing the same thing. It just varies a lot. And then we have blue, which is in, and red, which is um, no way. <coughs> Green basically is on the outside of the CDX, and blue is on the inside. So these two lines here are separated by half inch plywood. Uh, keep an eye on that because I think that's very interesting. <coughs> now look at this scan. The blue line is uh, its temperature we're looking. Lots and lots of scatter. This is the south wall. Why do we see so much more scatter on the south wall of this? The sun, thank you. It's the, it's the sun. What happens in this wall? Why do we see all of these temperature differentials? Let's think back about the type of material, the, the thermal conductivity of the material, the capacity of the wall. It's dense packed cellulose, it has a lot of weight to it, a lot of heat storage capacity. So what we're looking at really is the decrement delay. We're seeing basically a wall which it takes forever for heat to travel through. It's very dense, very low conductivity. It takes about 14 hours for thermal energy to get through this surface. Inside condition space, heated. Outside, cold. Thermal energy will go Always by physics, which way? Right. Our uh, unsolved engineering problem. We cannot keep thermal energy. Of course, I'm very confused. I'm the bedroom at the temperatures, and I've seen these huge fluctuations, which is inside the vast bulk of the thermal envelope. That's what I'm saying. That's what you're seeing. It's on the south side of the 
the building. We have 14 hours of time it takes for thermal energy to go out. What happens in 14 hours in a building? <coughs> he was already pointing it out. But you're close to the interior surfaces here, and you're going down to please, please, that's what I mean. discuss it for a day, but um, we're running out of time. But basically what we're, what we're seeing here is a very interesting effect, which I think is, is very, very important, detrimental aid, because this is very important cooling and for heating. It works both ways. This is what happens. We have such a massive fall, and it takes such a long time for thermal energy to travel out, that before it gets out, the sun comes back up because we bought ourselves time. The sun hits the outer surface of this wall, what happens? It warms up. Thermal energy cares about only one thing, and one thing only, warm the clothes. It doesn't have a sense of direction, it doesn't know what inside or outside is. It only knows that. So what we're seeing in here is basically temperature going right back in. We're never losing our heat. This to me proves the point that there is a myth out there saying it doesn't make sense to build anything over R50 because there's no return of investment. There is no gain out of a thick wall like this. Correct, if we're looking at just our value, that our value is measured really poorly. If we're looking at the whole picture, there's a lot of things going on which can really help us. That's the only reason I haven't had to keep this building since February 5th. I haven't heated this building at 24, 30 below temperatures. It's kept the heat so well. And I have a lot of sun in the spring. So decrement delay. This is very interesting here. We're looking at in and then out. That's basically just a pilot. It travels back and forth, transfers humidity levels, basically. Now look how this, again, you know, this is the building drying. That's why we see this being so much higher. But this is, again, you know, these two lines, blue and red, is only half inch plywood. One sensor is one side, the other sensor is right on the other side. So the plywood really is doing its thing, but look at this. Green is what? That's the sensor being on the outside of the building. Now, see how that more relates to the inside, you know, it doesn't care about the inside of the building, it cares about the plywood outside, basically. So here we're looking at what I believe we need to realize, outside only cares about the outside. If we have dew in the morning, and it's very humid, we walk through the grass, we don't do that. If we place any material on the ground that's going to be wet. And it's the outside which really governs that through absorption. We take a can of beer, we put it in the freezer, we take the block of wood, we put it in the freezer, a few hours later we take it out. What happens with the can of beer? Condensation. Condensation, yeah. What happens with the block of wood? Oh. What we'll see? Anything? Is there moisture dripping off them? No. Is there any difference in the moisture content? You know, this is very hygroscopic. So if we would measure that, the weight, it would be in here the same way. It sucks it up, which is the problem, like on this wall in very wet climates, we have wood outside to hold the insulation in. Well, that wood of that moisture on the outside will be in that wood. So that's careful. We gotta be careful with that because we have 18 inches of insulation between the only warm source to dry that out. Never gonna happen. So if we have a climate where the outside can never really dry because of climate, we have to be very, very careful with these thick walls because we eliminate the drying potential from the inside completely. There is just no residual heat enough from the building to dry it out. It works on a poorly built building because we lose so much heat. But we're like massive house builders, so we want to keep the heat, and it doesn't allow that material on the outside to dry. <coughs> Real quick, uh, nothing to do with the wall, but I think it's pretty interesting to 
see. Uh, part of this building, I put uh, 180 tons of thermal mass into the slab. It's basically uh, 1200 of EPS all the way wrapped around, cooler box, filled with a bunch of sand. Sand because it's cheap. Uh, doing this with concrete would be very, very expensive. Uh, I'm using this basically for two functions. Number one is a passive solar gain from a big window. And number two, active solar heating for heat storage in uh, the fall. Wouldn't want to do that in the summer. Uh, but what we really want to look at is passive solar gain. You know, thermal mass and cold climates, does this really make sense? A lot of people say it doesn't. I believe otherwise. But uh, here, we're looking at basically surface of the fall, three feet below the surface. And I haven't actively heated anything. This is the low winter sun beaming on my slab, changing temperature to that level. Here we're looking at active heating. Uh, the sun angle is still much higher, so we don't get as much passive on this yet. And this is basically you know, what it looks like. A lot of layer glass, high mass foundation. It's stained concrete, so we can absorb that heat. And we provide, basically, thermal energy when it hits the surface where you go. We need cool temperatures somewhere where we can trick this thermal energy. Hey, this is a good place for you to go, temporarily. We can only do that for a certain amount of time. But we can passively heat a building fairly well. And uh, even, you know, at very cold temperatures, I maintain 68 to 70 degrees just to this big window and this high mass slab. That's all I did. And uh, there's a big thermal shutter which closes this window uh, at night time. <coughs> and in the summer, a lot of people ask me this already, uh, in the summer I cool this window with an evaporation pot in the front. Uh, temperature is basically below the surface. This is uh, active. HLV usage on a ground loop. Uh, interesting to see too how it spikes up. And then here we're looking at the, basically we have uh, 400 feet of PEX, which pre warms incoming ventilation air. So it's buried 12 feet deep outside. We're capturing basically the ground temperature to uh, pre warm our ventilation air. Uh, it's interesting to see how it really affects things and how fairly late it starts going off and then it hits a certain temperature point and boom, it goes. I think that's you know, one, one of these things we really have to look at closely, how can we keep temperatures where they need to be? Because this goes both ways. There's a certain amount of temperature you get and then it just boom, it goes up or down. And if we could find exactly where that would be, we could eliminate some of these spikes, which would help us a lot. Moisture content in the sand, we heat it up, you see a lot more spikes, so we will probably dry that out, conductivity will go down, and uh, we will not be able to store as much. But nevertheless, uh, thermal mass, I just want to throw this out, it has really, really improved, very effective for me. perfect in a laboratory, in manufacturing, and we for sure can't build anything perfect in a construction site in America. <laughs> Germany maybe, but not <laughs> So nothing is perfect, and there is no perfect wall. We can try to find something which works very well for our climate, but it will only work well for us in our climate. And if we are taking a wall which used to be six inches, we decided to make it that 18 inches because we want to keep the heat in. That is not the same wall. It is a completely different beast. And we have to be careful. Why do we need to be careful? Because otherwise we have problems. Right? We have mold. We have health issues. That's something we can't just ignore. Building falls down, structural damage, all of these things. And whatever we do, we really need to look at data sets and we need to be diligent.
mind. I've done a lot of stupid stuff, and I'm doing stupid stuff all the time. And uh, that's the only reason to live. We need to try it out. And we need to be going back and trying to figure out, is this actually working? If it doesn't, we need to let people know. And we're always great about, hey, no, look what I am. But nobody ever wants to stand up and say, this doesn't work. So here is my big plea to everybody who is involved. If you're doing a project, no, it's the most fun to design it in the building. So don't forget about it. Come back. Look at it. And then don't just fire it in your own cabinet, but let people know. Because we will need this data. And we desperately, in our uh, so many different climate zones, will need to come up with answers. And you know, I can provide some in Alaska, but they're meaningless to most of you. There are certain things you can learn about it, but we need information from each and every one of us. And we need to keep the building signs straight in these things because it's very, very important. We want to make sure buildings function properly and they don't kill us slowly. So in all of that, uh, this will be up and we will have a full report out at full climate about this with all the data sets. Uh, just bear with me because it takes time. And uh, questions? So, in your original wall with the exterior foam and your new wall with the sailors, have you been able to understand the, the thermal delay? Yeah, yeah you the fall. That's a good question. If we built the same R value wall out of uh, EPS foam, time delay would be maybe four to six hours. Foam is a lightweight material. It doesn't have thermal mass. So the same R value, but a completely different delay basically on what time it actually takes for material to go out. So that is a big, big uh, improvement to me at least on this wall. We're introducing a lightweight from a lightweight material we go into a medium weight. Heavyweight would be, you know, ideally what we would want to do is pour, you know, wall on the inside, very thick, and then slap all the insulation on the outside. So we would have all the thermal mass, we would even have more of this effect of being able to take temperature swings and even them out, but it's expensive. Yep. How much of using a high density uh, cellulose prevents a lot of that moisture transfer to the locations where you think it uh, to, 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 it's, I mean, that's what we've seen on this one slide. Uh, cellulose will just take it, move it right across its plane because it's very hygroscopic, you know, which is perfectly fine until we, we, we have cold water. If we have a, like an air punch, you know, a hole where we introduce wet humid air traveling into it, we will create real problems. Air tightness is really the key. The thicker the wall, no matter what insulation material you use, the thicker the wall, the more problems that creates. I mean, that is the beauty about EPS foam. It doesn't care. You slap it up on the outside, and it does its thing, and it's, un it's totally forgiving. And uh, there, there's nothing you can do to hurt. Good, it's
stored up in buildings then is something you know which goes in a different direction, but it's very measurable. I mean, you take somebody and you put them into a very well built house, they feel happy. It's a positive energy. But you can't have them in a building which doesn't allow all of the things to come in. And that's <coughs> the way it is. We shall not forget where we come from. We're walking on the earth. We're human beings. We ask questions later. There's like 10 minutes until uh, the next session, so I want to make sure everyone can get there. Uh, thank you for the presenters.